42 people have been arrested. The cars were set alight. But the forces of law at times lost ownership of the streets of London. Britain is now in the midst of the longest recession. Banks have failed and shares have plummeted. 390 MPs overclaimed on their second homes allowance. It's payback time at Westminster. So do we have the determination to confront all this and turn it around? Britain is in crisis. We fail to protect our society from financial corruption, political scandal, family breakdown, and our problems are set to get worse. What's gone on in society in recent years has demonstrated the need for character. Have we lost our sense of direction? What does this mean for our children? Character starts from day dot, from day one. Your parents are part of your character development. Your friends are part of your character development. The environment that you live, that you play in as a child, is part of your character development. How do we equip young people with the skills and values they need to build the society of tomorrow? Schools should be talking about integrity, self-discipline, respect, consideration, confidence, tolerance, hard work, empathy, dedication, responsibility, and resilience all the things they need to be effective citizens in the world of tomorrow. It's exam followed by exam followed by exam. If we fail our children today, we jeopardize all our futures. We are at crisis points. We do need to equip our young people with the skills and knowledge that they need for, for life outside the school's gates. Are we teaching our children how to excel in exams and yet not in life? This next generation are going to have to be more versatile, more tenacious, more creative and collaborative than any generation that's gone before in order to navigate their way through the most complex, challenging society that's ever existed. So how can we help them fulfil their potential? I'm Katie Derham, and with two children aged 14 and 9, both rapidly working their way through our education system, like many parents, I'm concerned they really make the most of all those hours they're spending at school so that they can really fulfil their potential. And yes, I would like them to succeed in their exams. But much more importantly, I want them to succeed in life. And there is no doubt that life is becoming increasingly complicated, unpredictable and demanding. There's all sorts of challenges about not even knowing what sorts of jobs are going to exist in the future. Do you have the skill set coming out of school? Um, are you ever going to be able to buy your own house? All sorts of challenges around the environment. You've had generations before who have damaged the environment and you've got to somehow now, as a generation, cope with that. So I think it's an incredibly tough thing to grow up in the 21st century as a young person. Many employers say that school leavers these days, even the ones with really good grades, simply can't communicate effectively. And the CBI go even further. They say that their lack of social and personal skills and values will actually cause UK businesses to fold. In 2013, employers spent £43 billion on workplace training. So that shows the scale of the challenge. We're getting young people who don't know how to look you in the eye, who don't know how to turn up on time, who don't know how to interact and work as a team or communicate. Maybe just getting your A to C's isn't enough. It isn't what, what employers are looking for. The future adult needs to be continuously adaptable. We have no idea what challenges they'll be facing. We need them to be moral and decent people to be effective citizens in the world of tomorrow. In this programme, I want to find out whether character education can provide the next generation with the tools it needs to flourish. After all, our nation's future relies on them. So we owe it to all of us, to our kids, to society, to business, to the economy, to make sure that our children get the very best start in life. We still have a system that fails too many. So youth unemployment is still too high, we have 600, 700,000 young people out of work. If we don't get this right, we're not going to crack that nut. We want to see an education system that focuses on the development of character. Everyone from our Every politicians to our business are. leaders is asking schools to produce children with character. But what exactly do they mean by character? And how will it benefit modern Britain? 
for me, it's about the right ways of, of behaving and also identifying the wrong ways of behaving. So I think tenacity, resilience, hard work, honesty, uh, tolerance, I think is terribly, terribly important, especially in the world we live in today. Self-discipline, controlling what comes out of your mouth, controlling your behaviour, taking responsibility for your actions and not wishing to, to lay the blame on, on somebody else's door. But not everyone believes developing character is necessary or even possible. I'm a sceptic um, when it comes to character education. I just think the evidence that schools can teach various desirable character traits is extremely scant. Maybe if we can start having a national conversation about what we want schools to be doing in terms of these kinds of ethical, moral, spiritual aspects of, of, of our experiences as human beings, maybe we can actually move the debate on a bit. As a pioneering figure in education, James Arthur has dedicated his life to this debate. He believes developing character is so fundamental to society that three years ago he persuaded the University of Birmingham to set up the Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues. Clearly, this isn't just a philosophy. It's a mission. So, James, tell us first of all why you felt it was so important for the Centre to take on this work on character in the education system. I saw a gap in schools they had become too instrumental, too focused on short-term gains in terms of examinations, and an obsession with league tables. I felt that this was missing something. Uh, it was missing what good education is, and good education is also good character education. We, we find that, that if you develop the character, the exams look after themselves. We want children to be prepared for a, the life of tests, for the challenges which lie ahead, the challenges of marriage, the challenges uh, of employment, the challenges of just generally living in the 21st century. Character is a very broad word, isn't it? Some people would say it's all about resilience or grit. We have to ask, resilience for what? Grit for what? Members of the Mafia are very resilient. We have criminal gangs who are very resilient. We want them to be resilient so that they become part of society and make a contribution to society in a positive way. Do you really feel that the UK has lost its moral compass? Sometimes, reading the press, one would think so. You can see this with doctors, you can see this with bankers, this is across the whole of British society. But I like to think that there's hope. And the hope is that all these professions and our schools will emphasise that these ethical questions are hugely important and that we begin to re-establish uh, our moral compass. And just down the road from the Jubilee Centre, there's a new development that could reap very interesting results. James Arthur and his team are so certain that character can be taught, they're building a school that will centre around the teaching of it. Mike Roden is to be the new head teacher. No. So, I mean, Mike, this is so exciting, seeing this take shape. What exactly is your dream for this school? Well, to be, quite simply, the, the, you know, the best school in the country. OK, and we'll, we'll start there. Um, <laughs> and then character education. So yeah. a school designed in terms of its building, its recruitment of staff, is a, about personalising learning. Right, It's okay. about the individual, um, and that's important to me here. So what we can see here, which obviously at the moment it's difficult to imagine that this in a few months' time is going to be full of bright-eyed 11-year-olds and 16-year-olds as well. Yeah. The first day the children walk in, how excited they're going to be. If it's half as excited as I am, <laughs> we're on the winner. Let's talk a bit more about the whole ethos of the school because character is right at the heart. And character, I mean, what does that mean to you? We believe that we can teach character, we can teach children to become better people. We've got a bespoke character education program of study and that will be delivered as a taught program for 240 minutes uh, each week by what we term character mentors not form tutors. I'm sure that all this uh, good intention about teaching characters, music to parents, it is, but they're going to want their kids to pass exams. Parents have really bought in to the ethos that I've been talking about. They want 
characterful education, they want opportunities for their children and they want to be well taught by able and committed staff. For Year 7s, which have closed now, there's been 1,151 applications to the school for 150 places. While Birmingham University School may be devoting specific hours of its curriculum to character education, there is no one single blueprint for how this should be done. And of course, it's not a new idea. Most of our modern day values are based on the virtues of Aristotle. The heroes of ancient myth and classical literature were celebrated for having their characters tested. But while it may not be a revolutionary concept, the implementation of character education has to be relevant to today. Character is um, a set of interlocked skills and virtues which form a person and represent what a person is. And the virtues can be uh, described as the civic virtues, things like service, volunteering, uh, intellectual virtues, the ability to think through ideas, to think through what is the right thing to do, but also these moral virtues of honesty, of justice, uh, of ideas, uh, of uh, service uh, to others, uh, not just simply tolerating others, but being truthful. Uh, in situations. Every school has to make its own decisions about this. I think schools are not there to try and mould children's characters, not least because they can't. But the DNA plays a far bigger role uh, than we've hitherto understood. And as we understand more and more about the human genome and as more and more research is done into the link between uh, characteristics and DNA, uh, we're beginning to discover just how much of your personality is essentially a blueprint which is set when you're born. I don't think it's all about genetics. You can cultivate and acquire character through your social environment. Why would a teacher become a teacher if it was predetermined? So we mustn't limit our ability to develop the character by thinking it's all about genetics. The question, can character be taught, can only really be answered by seeing it in practice. And schools throughout the UK are interpreting character education in many different ways. Some claim to be seeing really significant results. Just 12 years ago, King's Langley School in Hertfordshire was placed in the bottom 3% of schools in the country. It was about to be shut down, which was no surprise to the head teacher tasked with turning it around, Gary Lewis. Appalling behaviour, very low standards of, at, at everything, actually. And so we went for a seven-year programme of steady, controlled improvement. It has been a long term, a long term which has seen you work extraordinarily hard. Not taking any shortcuts, building up our character and ethos as a school, step by step with each year group. And I believe that now we're in a very successful position. I mean, roughly we're in the top quarter of schools in terms of our examination performance, which I think we're very pleased with. You're clearly all aware of what procrastination is. So it's this constant Okay, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it next week. We must have schools that are very well led, well managed, um, behaviour must be excellent. But they must also be places where youngsters can flourish, make mistakes, um, learn to be creative. And I really don't think they can do that if they are constantly preparing for the next test or the next examination. We're providing an environment that promotes and nurtures good character. It's 360 degrees, it's not just one aspect of what we do. And it doesn't take long for new students to catch on to the school's ethos. So well done, playing very, very well. Thank You've you. only been here for about, what, about a term, haven't you, at King's Langley? So how, how is it? How is it different from your primary school? Um, it's really fun. It's longer days, but... So you've been learning all about character here at King's Langley. What does that mean? What kind of stuff have they been teaching you? Um, they teach you like how to behave and how to respond to things when you're older and um, how you can learn from your mistakes in doing things. Head boy and head girl of the school, Luke and Shani, have spent the last seven years developing their characters. So tell us a bit about what the character teaching here has meant to the two of you and how you feel it's affected you. 
There's three character words Mr Lewis uses, empathy, self-regulation and stickability. And I think we sort of leave with those three character traits. It's like when I first came into this school, I was an extremely shy child. I wouldn't do anything, I wouldn't speak to anyone. And I, you're not that now. I, exactly. <laughs> I Somehow I'm that. not. <laughs> do you think that this character education is going to help you achieve your goals? It is so important to have those grades, but I don't think I would be able to go and do the things that I want to do if I couldn't talk to people, if I wasn't socially aware. You wouldn't be able to go out into the world that we live in and survive. However, according to Deputy Head Ruth Jennings, embedding character education into a school is a gamble. Is it something that you think you could replicate in another school? I mean, would you fancy taking it on somewhere else? As much as I think it would be worth re trying to replicate, because I do think it works, I don't think in the, the Ofsted system it's feasible. You're given 18 months as a new head teacher to try and turn a school around. It's not something I'd want to take on. But that seems such a, a shocking criminal waste of somebody talented like you to not take this on to another school just because of the system. You're trying to change parents, pupils, teachers' perceptions. To try and change that around in 18 months, and if you don't do it and the results don't improve, as a head teacher, you're, you're, you're out. There are many, many head teachers who lose their jobs following Ofsted inspections. It won't necessarily show as a sacking, but teachers, head teachers will move, will move on following Ofsted inspections on a regular basis. I don't mind saying that because that's a fact. Ofsted inspects state schools on average every three years. And as we discovered while filming, they don't give much warning. Good morning, Gary Lewis speaking. We've had an interesting phone call at 10 past 12 today. Um, Ofsted rang. So we'll have a full inspection team visiting the school tomorrow and Wednesday. A lead inspector with three additional inspectors. Um, I'd like to say we were looking forward to it, but that would be an absolute lie. But it's a challenge that all schools have to go through. Ofsted is obsessed by metrics. They look at tables. They look at what the school league tables, they look at what, how many children pass examinations, they compare them with the national average, etc. This is a very narrow way of judging a good school. A good school is about a good education, and you cannot reduce a good education to a set of exam results on a table. Britain is not alone in the debate on character education. Instilling character in the next generation is a global challenge and many countries are adopting different methods of teaching character in school. Scandinavia, parts of the, the Far East, um, America and Canada, there's loads of examples of education systems that have this just much more embedded, that you're trying to create the rounded individual, not just you know a hothouse for academic excellence. If you go to a place like Singapore, it is centrally part of their educational system. It's an authentic mandate. There's financing behind it. There's curriculum about it. Every school has it. I don't want to hold them up as perfect, but they are very, very good, in the, and their the results on the world stage are, are way up there. One of the things we find in the Far East countries is that for them, philosophy and becoming a good citizen is part of the purpose of education. In the United Kingdom, in the United States, it kind of gets bolted on as an afterthought. And I think America's done a much better job than Britain has. The USA in particular has been trying to build character in many of its schools. So how do they do it? And what can we learn from them? I challenge all our schools to teach character education, to teach good values and good citizenship. At stake are not just the details of policy, but fundamental principles of social justice and the character of our country. Riverdale Country School in the Bronx, New York, is at the forefront of the US debate on character. There's interest right now, both in public and private education in the US, um, around how one develops these things that they call non-cognitive skills or strengths. There is definitely more of an emphasis in the US on social-emotional um, growth and the importance of it, the importance of uh, relating to one another well and to discussing feelings. Certainly the system here allows for something beyond just grades and test scores. And I think that the university admissions offices have expressed a lot of interest in personality or character. How do you develop character in schools is, I think, something that we're really all trying to figure out. In fact, it's something Americans have been trying to figure out for some time. 
In the US, there was definitely this sort of character movement in the 80s. I don't think there was much science behind that. It was a view that um, somehow character was lacking. And I think that that became co-opted by a sort of political view of this, particularly by the right in America. The only way that something like this can be successful is if it's not a, you know, a Republican or Democratic um, sort of campaign platform. At Riverdale, they're trying to enhance the characters of everyone from kindergarten to senior school. Optimism means like you always look on the bright side. Yeah, and conversations and grit means that if there's something hard, you never give up. You keep trying, don't give up. Yeah, Adventurous yeah. means you like, try stuff like you never done before. Like you never tried a soup, you try it and you might like it. So it kind of helped us a lot because then we, now we know we have to do those things to be to have a good life. And when we're upstairs, we're going to have to work very hard on our homework. So we're going to show a lot of grit. That's for sure. <laughs> The school prides itself on its extensive extracurricular activities. Everything from drama to swimming, fencing and basketball are seen as key to developing character. I believe that my teachers have definitely helped me build my character and become more uh, independent and confident and I've become a better team player. In Riverdale where character is such a big part of this society that uh, there's a lot of self-respect, there's a lot of mutual respect. He's uh, grown to become a young man. The concept of the American dream since seems like completely wedded to the idea of these character strengths. And I think the American dream, I guess, was this idea that, you know, you could find social mobility through, you know, incredible effort. Just a few miles south, the American dream is alive and well in the Harlem Children's Zone a group of schools that are financially and socially poles apart from Riverdale. They believe character education will inevitably improve the life chances of their students. We weave it in everything that we do. It's a part of the ethos of, of the Harlem Children's Zone. There are a number of, of key characteristics that we try to focus on. Um, leadership, for one, resilience, perseverance, love of learning, uh, responsibility, citizenship. You should always learn about character ed because you can learn new stuff like responsibility and honesty and respect. Respect is about um, treating people how you want to be treated. The Harlem Children's Zone is located in a particularly deprived part of New York, which presents its own set of challenges. Unfortunately, there, there are circumstances that um, provide barriers for success within the community. Um, so it's impoverished, there's um, some negative health outcomes, there's large incarceration numbers. Most large urban school districts in America are highly dysfunctional systems for which it's very, very hard to go in there and clean up Dodge City and get rid you know, and drive out the bad guys and, you know, take it over. Every day there's a threat of potential violence with um, local gang activity or um, criminal activity that, that's happening. Um, there's also poverty in terms of how are we going to potentially even afford to eat. It's our job as the Harlem Children's Zone to be able to surround them with a support network or a, a net of services that is woven so tight that no one can fall through the cracks. This exercise is to help you, help you identify certain traits that will lead you into becoming a very successful person. I'm happy we're having this discussion. My dream is to be an Olympic sprinter. We usually run in the hallways because we don't have a track here. The focus, the confidence, the determination, that helped me into academics because you need a lot of those traits to be successful. Sports is a great equalizer in terms of creating the environment for some of these character traits to be able to come out. So I think every day it's a struggle, but we don't let any barrier get in the way of letting our children know that they have high potential and that they will be um, successful in life. Inspired by a visit to the States, the senior management team of secondary school King's Leadership Academy, including Principal Shane Erston, 
decided to form their version of the American model and in 2012 transplanted it slap bang in the middle of Warrington. <laughs> So tell me about the influences that you found and were inspired by when you went over to the States. Something that came across really, really strongly was there was a massive sense of can-do culture, can-do attitude, and some of the character traits they were trying to reinforce, like grit and resilience, it just seemed to make a lot of sense, and it seemed that perhaps that was a core ingredient that was missing. And so, in a nutshell, how are you doing that? What we're trying to do is establish firm values in the, in the child so they've got this constant moral compass so they know how to behave and how to act. Kings, one, two, three. Aspire! Thank you, everyone. Sit down, iPads out, please. There seems to be an almost military style order and discipline here at Kings. Is that something you made a conscious decision about? The children constantly check their own behaviour. They don't need the staff to regulate them. And that climate can look militaristic when in actual fact it's just really good behaviour. I notice some kids doing jiu-jitsu and I know they do fencing as well. These aren't standard sports for schools, are they? One of the things about the, those sports is they, they focus on mastery and concentration. So the child has to sort of re repeatedly develop a real um, focus to be successful in those particular sports. And we think that aligns itself really well with character. In the morning, the school concentrates on academic studies, and the afternoon is dedicated to character-building extracurricular activities, which results in a longer school day. In America, they worked longer hours and they did it differently, but so much of it was about building about the confidence of the child and a child's belief that they could achieve. And that's the belief that I've tried to put into King's Leadership Academy. So what does character education mean to the pupils? It's a topic regularly discussed in the school's parliament. Welcome to King's Leadership Academy School of Parliament. Let's get down to business. Could I interrupt Prime Minister and Parliament? Yes. My name's Katie. I'd love to ask you a couple of questions if that's all right. Do so, Joe, do you think that character is something that you were born with? Ah, uh, no. I think, I think characters, character is something that people work on. I think character is something that's made better by being taught it, like, in, through leadership lessons and public speaking. How do you think the school and all their ideas about discipline and character have changed you? I'm definitely more self-aware now. Um, I've got a lot more respect for the people around me and a lot more respect for the school and the teachers. I think if schools concentrated more on character development, we find a society where we're far more competitive within this world, producing more leaders, better team players and a more dynamic society. This school, it really like pushes you to try your best and to not only be good at your work, but also be good at just being yourself. So Colin, as a parent at the school, I know you've got a son in year seven here. What effect has it had on him, the emphasis on character at King's? Well, it's really been quite astounding. He started year seven in September, just a few months ago, as quite a quiet, shy little boy. Whereas now he's, he's really come out of himself. He's speaking to grown-ups and other people with a massive amount of confidence. This obviously means an awful lot to you. What they're doing at King's is really, really special. They're focusing on removing the ceiling and making sure that every child, regardless of their background, can achieve the very high, highest heights and no dream is too small for any of these children. OK, how do you think motivation influences leadership then? Teachers obviously play a huge part in making those dreams come true. Educators have golden hearts. The vast majority truly love children and they come to education to serve children's best interests. They probably spend more time with their teachers than they do with their parents. So teachers have got a massive role to play in a child's life. They can make or break a child. In England, as long as you go to school, it doesn't matter very much which school you go to. And yet, the teacher you have makes an extraordinary difference. So the teacher you have makes about four times as much difference as which school you go to. So undoubtedly the responsibility of teaching character weighs heavily on the shoulders of teachers. But should it? Or is it all down to the parents? Those youngsters who have tremendous support from home, who have high expectation, who have had fantastic nurturing from word go, they are set on a course that normally leads to success. Yeah? The youngsters who have have been denied that for one reason or another, they face a challenge. We have a duty as society to do everything we can as parents, as educators, to enable that we're, to ensure that we're a positive kind of role model because young people will catch that character from us. The old 
African proverb is it takes a village to raise a child. And I think that as soon as we start saying it's that person's job or it's that person's job, then I think we're in real trouble. And if it takes a village to raise a child, then the Springburn Academy in Glasgow are doing something right. The school is situated in one of the poorest areas of the UK. And a few years ago, it was virtually unheard of for any of its students to go on to university. But things changed in 2010, when they introduced a mentor scheme for underprivileged children. A lot more young people have gone to university in the last four years. So that's something that's in itself tells, it tells a bit of a story. In 2003, four, two young people went to university. Whereas in 2013, 14, 52 young people went on to higher education. The children spend around an hour a week developing their character with a personal mentor. If you've had some issues in your life and your affiliation with the school isn't, hasn't been as big a thing, then this is another way to bridge that gap between home and school. I started mentoring after I retired. I wanted to do it because I had been in a family where no one had ever gone to university before and I understood the challenges that these young people in this area face. Having a mentor is definitely so beneficial. I think the one thing she always taught us and always told us was that we shouldn't look down on ourselves, no matter like what school you come from or what you think your background was. You just sort of use that to your advantage and sort of build on that because when you get into uni, it's just a level playing field. It's helped me find my future. Uh, my future's not set in stone, so seeing what I want to do, seeing all the different chances, the possibilities, it's helped so much. If you become a young adult, sometimes the last person you want to listen to is your parent. And I think that somebody from outside of the family is, is it can be a very positive role model for a lot of young people. There's certainly a lot of work needs to happen with each young person to sort of help them realise their futures and keep them focused and keep them believing that they can actually attain highly and go into university and into the most competitive courses. As well as the community supporting young people, Young people can get a lot out of supporting the community. Young people develop hugely important kind of character and virtue skills through doing social action, so whether that's volunteering or fundraising. We have had uh, a randomised control trials done, supported by the Cabinet Office, of our youth social action projects. So there is really hard evidence that these sorts of activities, done in the right way, facilitated in the right way, will lead to the right sort of character development. They're developing their communication skills, their team building, their resilience, all sorts of other char character traits that you're going to need in whatever environment you live in as an adult. So mentors, our community, our teachers, our parents, our genes, they all have an influence on the person we become. But does money make a difference? Statistics show the wealthy tend to stay wealthy. If you're privileged, you can pay for a private education or you can move to an expensive area to be close to a top state school. Many private schools in particular pride themselves on developing children of character. Wellington College is no exception. Historically, performance at a private or public school has outshone almost any school in the state sector. There just seems to be more opportunity at a school like this one, and indeed beyond. And there is strong evidence to support this as well. Take any of those classic traditional leadership roles in our society. Three quarters of our judges were privately educated, a third of the cabinet, half of all our diplomats, and yet only 7% of the children in this country were sent to a private school. Many would argue a well-resourced school is well-placed to nurture excellence. But Wellington's master, Sir Anthony Selden, is adamant that regardless of money or background, if you develop character, academic achievement will follow. You simply, simply cannot say that doing the character stuff is at the cost of academic results. It doesn't make any sense. And what's more, there are endless examples of state schools and independent schools that do the character stuff well, that get fantastic results. When you talk about the character stuff, mm. what I want to know really is how you make that work. Schools should be talking about values around kindness, integrity, courage, respect, responsibility, diligence, etc. Every day. 
They should be up in every classroom, these values in the corridors, but much more than that, they should be lived. Pupils at Wellington aim to embody the school's core values. <laughs> Is it something that you're conscious of, that you look out for in your friends? How does that work? I don't think that you can consciously build character, but because it's kind of everywhere around us, it kind of distills into your subconscious. I think integrity and courage are really important because it takes courage to you know, uphold your integrity. And, and integrity is important because without integrity you can't be respectful or responsible when you're in a situation that might compromise your values. When we look out on the world, we tend to only notice stuff that's relevant to us. And we also only tend to notice stuff that fits in with what we already think. Ian Morris teaches well-being classes at the school, which are specifically designed to build character and promote self-awareness. Character education happens when the normal curriculum is being delivered through subjects like English and chemistry. Um, so you acquire intellectual virtues that way. But you can also teach what are called performance virtues. So you can teach children to be more resilient, um, you can teach them to help build empathy and, and other moral virtues and relational virtues. One of the big changes that we notice is a kind of a calmness and an ability just to step back and reflect on their lives. Um, and this is a sort of really important part of becoming more virtuous and developing good character. So I, I think if we can reprioritise education to put well-being, character, flourishing as the main aim, then we can put results in their proper place. Many educationalists believe that being complete, being ready for all that life will throw at you, means being able to cope when things go wrong. However, many also believe that if you attend a very high-performing school, then maybe you never have experienced failure and that you've actually been protected from making mistakes. Failing exams, failing job interviews or university interviews, that will happen to everybody. And if you're not used to dealing with that and picking yourself up, I'm not quite sure how you're going to manage the many, many other disappointments that are inevitable in everybody's life. We have a culture that is intolerant of mistakes, and particularly in our schools, and that's why we end up with students who are just terrified of doing anything wrong. So we have students just avoiding any risks, and that's tragic. I see lots of parents who make a huge mistake and think that loving one's child is about protecting them all the time. Massive mistake. Children are walking behind somebody clearing the path for them, never facing the challenges, never having to deal with, have difficult conversations or deal with failure or be told no, that isn't happening. They're not used to hearing that. And ultimately the snow plough of the parent will disappear. There's a lot of talk about teaching character values at secondary schools. That's what we really we've been concentrating on. But you could argue it has to start so much earlier. In fact, should it start at reception? Should it actually start even younger than that? Well, I think the first sound of a baby's cry is when you begin character education. The parents are the first educators. They move on to schools, which is concerned about the formation of human beings. And therefore, it's very important that schools begin very early, from the age of three in nursery, straight through to 19. It never stops. When a child is born, they're born with over 200 billion brain cells, no connections. By the time they're 18 months, the connections are made. By the time they're seven, they're fully made. Everything they see, everything they feel, everything they smell is affecting their brains. But if you wait until they're, they're older, you've lost them. So there's a famous series of experiments involving marshmallows in which children, some as young as 22 months, um, have marshmallows put in front of them and they're told they can either have the marshmallow that's in front of them or if they resist it for 15 minutes they can then have two marshmallows. And um, the children who resist um, uh, generally, when they track them over the years, do much better because they've shown that they have the ability to control their impulses and defer gratification. If I was the Secretary of State for Education, I'd look very carefully at the provision for children 0 to 5 and look to make a big investment in that area, especially for those youngsters who are drawn from our most challenging uh, areas. There's one example of this from the United States where they invested in a very intensive preschool program. It lasted two years. Forty years later, the people who got the expensive preschool treatment were less likely to be in prison, 
less likely to have been arrested five times, more likely to be working in a job that gave them health care. And they calculated that every dollar they'd spent on this preschool program returned $13 to society. So there's no doubt that investing early is much better value than investing later. As a primary school, Topcliffe in Birmingham is well-placed to begin that character investment. So Dickon, you obviously think that it's really important to get started early with these kids when it comes to teaching them character and values. It, it's, it's, it's really important. They need to start at home before they even get to school. But right from the word go here, from reception, you've got that in mind with the curriculum. Yes, certainly they have to know what, uh, how, to, how to behave, how to interact with each other, what it is to be a member of a much larger society when they're at home with mum and dad. It's a very small little world. Here it's the big wide world. The children learn to develop their character through the five keys. The five keys are like rules, but they're like encouraging rules. Two of them are manners don't cost anything and every action has a reaction. Hard yeah. work and helping Play others. Nice. Helping others and, um, and tidying up. Stop, or is it stop? Stop being, are oh, you doing the right thing? And don't be afraid to ask questions and respect yourself, respect others and respect the world around you. It teaches us how to behave while we're little so it gets into us for when we're older. Things I've probably noticed the most is the fact that the children are um, a lot more resilient, a lot more polite, a lot more tolerant of, of each other. The children are unbelievably empathetic to, to all children and understand their needs. They know that education is fun and I think they enjoy coming to school. Morning, how are you doing? You're right, excuse me. Morning, <laughs> quite all right. how are you? You're right. Morning, you're all right. You're so do you always spend every morning out here yes, saying hello? Yes, yeah, every yeah. morning. Uh, there will be a member of the senior leadership team uh, or our learning mentor outside uh, on the gates. Welcome everybody in in the mornings. Just starts the day off nicely. And, and, and um, get to know the parents. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, morning, how are you? Morning. You're right, you're right. So do you think other schools who maybe were facing challenges, like Topcliffe was a few years ago, do you think they'd appreciate being given a set of instructions, given a set of rules, this is how you could make your school work and bring character and value into the curriculum? It depends on the area, the, uh, the, the children you have in the school, the needs of those children, the parents, the needs of those parents, mm. and society that surrounds the school. Um, should there be a set defined rules to do, uh, to, to carry this out, to, to promote character and values? No. Um, it really is down to each individual school. But is it possible to measure character? How do we know it's actually working? It's clear from what we've seen that various forms of character education do have an impact, but do we need cold, hard facts? You can't just give a test for character. We can't give you a grade for your character. But we know when it happens. We know when children learn these virtues and practice them. And when they do, people recognise it. The real problem with character education is it's almost impossible to assess. If you want to measure perseverance, you ask students questions like, do you try hard when you're stuck? And of course, any student is going to say yes. So all these aspects of learning are incredibly important, but they're very difficult to measure with any validity. People say character is difficult to measure, but we do it in the workplace. What targets do we hit? But also, how do we perform? How do we deal with customers? How do we deal with other members of the team? So if character can be assessed, do businesses feel the employees of the future measure up? Over half of employers are concerned about a lack of basic skills in the workplace. We're not critical of young people. We're not critical of teachers or schools. We're critical of the system. Some schools have become exam factories turning out exam robots. Business leaders need ethical employees, people uh, of ethical standing, who understand and can recognise ethical problems uh, when they arise, like we've had examples from the banking sector. The future will belong to those who can go out and find these resources and organise their own learning. And that's why character and resilience will be so important in the future. So what role should government and policy makers play in all this? How far should their decisions dictate how schools develop children's character? 
If you look at the systems that have become really successful, one of the things that characterizes them is stability. When politicians get involved, you tend to produce you know, people doing something and then something else and something else. It's like trying to steer an oil tanker by doing, you know, turning the rudder hard left and then a minute later turning it hard right and just, and the tanker doesn't move. We need politicians to stay out of it. And that's difficult because of course, politicians create their reputations by doing stuff. The days of um, teachers being allowed to teach were derailed the day that Tony Blair said, it's about education, education, education. Ask me my three main priorities for government. And I tell you, education, education, and education. What I would have preferred him to say is, it's about children, children, children. He made, in my opinion, education a political uh, football. Government should say teaching character and values is very important. I think should think that it should then devolve to schools exactly how they're going to do it, and it should let the schools themselves, and indeed the children, for goodness sake, uh, play a fundamental role in deciding what the values are. Politicians generally have a tendency to leap on the latest fad, particularly in education. These non-controversial policy areas where they think everyone will, will buy into this. Most of the major parties have now put character education on the political agenda. Character education represents a rigorous, evidence-based philosophy with the power to take us decisively beyond the top-down, target-driven, exam-obsessed culture, which in recent years seems to become our system's damaging default setting. For too long, there has been a false choice between academic standards and activities that build character and resilience. But the two should go hand in hand. So last week I announced a new £5 million fund to support innovative ideas to help schools and, and young people develop character, resilience and grit. So has this new political drive towards character education filtered down to Ofsted? Gary Lewis at King's Langley is about to find out. So a, a summary of the key findings for parents and pupils, of which I'm absolutely delighted. The schools work in promoting the spiritual, moral, social and character development of students leads to outstanding behaviour and highly positive re relationships throughout the school. I like the fact that a skilled Ofsted team has made the link between outstanding behaviour and attitudes and focus on character development. And it's, as, it, as it were, it's there in black and white. I think it's a very significant moment that Ofsted have chosen to comment on the character of young people in schools and actually put that into a report as a commendation for the school. And I hope Ofsted begins to do that with other schools as well. I was particularly delighted that they were able to see what was at the heart of our school and, and to that end I must congratulate them. So well done Ofsted. And I don't often say that. <laughs> so does this mark a new era of education? Will young people be ready for the challenges ahead? There's no question that the next generation needs to prepare itself for a rapidly changing social, technological and economic environment. So, is saving our society, saving our economy and achieving personal fulfilment simply a question of character? We are on a ton and point. The idea of character education in schools is moving quickly I think schools are going to be asked by government and also by Ofsted to look at this area uh, and to make sure that they're providing an all-round education for the children in our schools. There's no doubt that the rate of change is continuing to accelerate. The future adult needs to be continuously adaptable. We have no idea what's coming. That's the challenge. I don't think people fully understand that childhood lasts a lifetime. And whatever you do to the child at that young age matters because it will manifest itself later on in life. It's really important that every school and every college prioritises the development of character in its young people because the economic gains are so huge. We estimated that if we could raise the level of our education system to match the very best in Europe, that could add £8 trillion to GDP, which is a massive sum. I personally believe that every child has a right to character education and that we owe it to our children to continue this debate and to make sure in every school that we build the character of every child. 
when I'm older I want to be a famous tennis player or a famous gymnast. I think I'm going to be a professional tennis player. I want to go into something to do with music, so maybe like music producing or maybe even performing music if I'm lucky enough. I think I'd be like a pop star. I want to be a queen. I want to be a doctor. I want to be like an accountant. And I'm going to run for president. I don't want to touch politics. I think it will corrupt me. When I grow up, I want to be a character ed teacher.